On the occasion of Canada's 100th birthday in 1967, Chief Dan, Jan, Dan George, uh, incidentally born, uh, I guess, Wanuth Slahut, uh, shared with us his lament for Confederation. Uh, he it gave voice to sadness and, and, and the injustices that we had done to First Nations and Indigenous peoples, uh, yet he still managed to end his lament in hope with these words. O Canada, I shall see these things come to pass. I shall see your young braves and our chiefs sitting in the houses of law and government, ruling and being ruled by the knowledge and freedoms of our great land. So shall we shatter the barriers of our isolation. So shall the next hundred years be the greatest in the proud history of our tribes and nations. Fifty years ago, Chief Dan George's voice was briefly heard hoping and believing that voice would be given to First Nations and Indigenous people, that they would reclaim their pride and claim their place with us in the great nation of nations, our community of communities that we call Canada. Ontario, well, we, must take up our obligation to give voice to our fellow citizens, that they may be heard and enjoy all of the opportunities, rights and freedoms due to every Ontarian, to every Canadian, by strengthening Indigenous representation in government. To that end, I propose five things. One, representation. Provide two of Ontario's seats in the Parliament of Canada for the direct representation of Indigenous people. Request that one seat in the Senate of Canada be allocated to the Ontario Indigenous peoples to guide and inform Canada's progress and provide two seats in the Legislature of Ontario to represent Indigenous peoples that they may lead the continuing process of reconciliation and represent the voice and will of their peoples. Federal representation for Indigenous people in Ontario is provided through the Electoral Boundaries Readjustment Act 1985, which calculates the representation in Parliament for each province and territory. Subsequently, each province then recommends, through their Provincial Commission on Electoral Boundaries, the division of their region into the various electoral districts. Pursuant to the Electoral Boundaries Readjustment Act, Section 15.2a, which provides for departures from the electoral district population equality premise, and I quote, in order to respect the community of interest or community of identity in or the historical pattern of an electoral district in the province. In an 1872 statement to Parliament, Sir John A. Macdonald said, different interests, classes, and localities should be fairly represented but the principle of numbers should not be the only one. The Supreme Court of Canada in Carter held that deviations from voter parity could be acceptable if justified according to the criteria set out. Provincial representation is a mere matter of will in the legislature. There are no prescribed rules or laws in Ontario for the number or divisions of electoral districts. The Ontario Far North Boundaries Electoral Commission has recommended two new electoral districts in Northern Ontario pursuant to their directive the concluding remarks of their report, Further Considerations, proposes that non-contiguous electoral districts be considered for better and more effective representation of the Indigenous population in our province, and I wholeheartedly agree. A Senate seat for Ontario's Indigenous population is simply a matter of willingness on the part of the Prime Minister to make it so. While the current PM has undertaken a, a merit-based Senate appointment process, surely our Indigenous rep peoples merit representation in our governments. Two. Self-government. Incorporate Indigenous lands and communities into an appropriate number of Ontario municipalities with all of the rights and privileges thereof and in respect of their traditional civil governance systems. The incorporation of First Nations and other communities into municipalities is a matter of the pleasure of the legislature. It's necessary to provide the structural foundation between governments and among communities. These new, new municipalities must be free to choose their own systems of government, including their traditional leadership and governance models, as well as enjoying the freedom to develop and manage their own education, health, and other social systems. Three, environmental stewardship. Create environmental regions extending from each Ontario municipality. The municipal governments will provide environmental stewardship of those lands and waters in recognition of the fact that the natural environment is best sustained, developed, and protected by those who live, breathe, and play in those environments. Such stewardship practices would work to the benefit of Ontarians, Canadians, and the people of the world. Pursuant to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and specifically Article 26, we must respect First Nations and modern communities' rights to protect and or develop their relevant environments. While in dense urban areas, our relevant environment is effectively the meters on our houses, Indigenous communities have relevant environments that extend hundreds of kilometres from their homes. 
Four, self-determination. Enact self-determination legislation to the effect that no higher order of government shall override the choices of a lower order of government without demonstrable justification of the greater good being served, and where that proof shall generally exclude private economic profit rationale. Through self-determination legislation, we would ensure stability and security for Indigenous communities and every community in Ontario. It would provide a reasonable and rational framework for independence within the collective by entrenching the legal standard of proof for the greater good. The general exclusion of the private profit rationale would ensure that the greater good is measured and ultimately tested against the best interests of people and not those of abstract cor corporate entities. Self-determined legislation is simply entrenching the right of individual liberty within the right of association. And five, charter rights protection. Enact and amend all necessary legislation to ensure that treaty rights, contracts, or other agreements between Indigenous peoples and the Government of Canada do not derogate from their equal rights and opportunities as Ontarians, or give rise to any limitation on their rights and freedoms under the Constitution of Canada, notably mobility and the right of association. Charter rights protection would be by far the least simple of these five simple things to achieve because of the vast number of amendments and laws that would need to be addressed Yet it's fundamentally essential if we are to consider ourselves a free and democratic nation built on equality. We must simultaneously guarantee all charter rights and freedoms to Indigenous peoples while protecting their historical, treaty, and natural rights. The first cannot derogate from the second, and the assurance of that is found in these words themselves when added to every piece of legislation and every rule, that nothing herein derogates or otherwise limits existing rights, claims, and or rights to new claims. Representation, self-government, environmental stewardship, self-determination, charter rights protections. A short and simple list. We must undertake these things to forge a stronger Ontario. An Ontario grounded in respect and equality, guided always by an understanding of each person's, each community's, and each nation's unique nature, and by the principle that the individual rights of liberty and the community rights of self-determination are not incompatible with but in fact necessary to our collective spirit to live and prosper together under the umbrella of the province of Ontario within the Federation of Canada. Our strength is our diversity. If we strengthen our diversity, we'll be stronger. Thank you.